Europe's industrial scene. Quite a transformation in five years. Think of it. Only a short time ago, a lot of our factories were just so many heaps of rubble and scrap iron. Now, many of them are busier than they've ever been, with more orders than they can handle. I think the war brought us Europeans to realize how dependent we are on our own industries. And that's why there's so much interest in them today, so much discussion of whether they're as modern as they might be, whether they're efficient or not, and what their future prospects are. Well, I'm interested for one. I agree that Europe's industries are busy, but they don't seem to be having much effect right here. And this is Europe, too. Now, surely, where people are still living without the simplest necessities, let alone comforts, that's a challenge to industry. How are you going to meet it? You see this anvil and the little workshop behind it. This is where one European set out in 1898 to answer your question. His name was Louis Renault. These are the Renault factories just outside Paris, as they are today. You see, Louis Renault borrowed from your American method. He remembered the famous saying of Henry Ford, keep material three feet from the floor and keep it moving. Mass production, isn't that the answer? Standardize what you produce, standardize how you produce it, then there'll be more things for more people. In the war, this plant was bombed three times over. Then there was martial aid, and look now, 400 cars a day, one every 85 seconds. Mass production, that's what Europe needs. Sure, it's impressive, all right. But is mass production the whole answer? When I visit Denmark, for instance, and see the wonderful work of the silversmith there, I can't help thinking that if Europe were to lose her sense of personal craftsmanship, she'd have lost something very precious, something irreplaceable, in fact. You have heard of our glass makers of Venice? Watch them. You see here the character of Europe going into the things they make. this passion for fine workmanship were lost in favor of mass production, he would certainly remove much beauty from the world. But also he would probably make Europe not richer, but poorer. Abolish Europe's craftsmen, and you abolish an important source of foreign currency. Please tell me, how then do we earn our food? One moment. Look at this photo factory in my country, Germany. Many people want German beer. It's good beer. To meet the demand, we must make nearly a million beer bottles a day. It is not a question of mass production or craftsmanship. There's need for bottles made by hand and for bottles made automatically, like this. that Europe's markets, both at home and abroad, demand quality, but they demand great variety as well. Our problem in this factory was to find ways of combining the variety demanded with the high rate of output, which can only be assured by modern machinery. Well, we did it. Variety, high rate of output. And I'd suggest there's another vital factor, low cost. Well, now, let's take a case. This gas stove factory, where they've been getting costs down by improving their methods. They started right at the beginning, 
in the sun. Instead of the men carrying the heavy crucibles to each mould in turn, they arrange for the moulds to come to the men. It saved time, and just as important, it saved effort. looking at every process in the factory from the same point of view. Cooking stoves are badly needed pretty well everywhere in Europe. Was the time and energy of the workers really being used in the best way? A chap who was making angle irons pointed out that it was taking five operations to do the job, with a jig that was old when his father was born. There was a better way, welding. Now, the same job's done in three operations, and done faster, simpler, and better. And the result of such changes was that output was increased, the work was made easier for everyone, and the cost of the stoves was reduced. Yes, and I saw something even better in the furniture factories of Sweden. The application of modern methods to the craftsman's skill, enabling him to speed his work. and the increased output being handled, too, by up-to-date methods. It seemed to me that they were getting the best of the old and the new. That's it, as we in Britain are doing in our textile industry, where we have the same problems we've talked of. Here in Lancashire, we're producing for markets all over the world. We must offer plenty of variety. At the same time, our output must be high, we must keep our costs down, and we must preserve our craftsmanship. Take another example, the printing of fabrics. Remember the way they used to do it, hand blocking? Mind you, I don't say it's completely out of date. It's still required for certain fine fabrics. But for quantity, it's hopelessly slow. And besides, for quantity production, it's using men as though they were machines. And if that's nothing else, it's inefficient. Here's our answer. Engraving the designs direct onto the rollers of high-speed printing presses. The skilled craftsmen are still there. They'll always be needed. But their fine workmanship is being multiplied many times over by machinery. And high output by efficient methods usually leads to low costs. As we see it, the future of Europe's industries lies partly in mass production, but mostly in high production. That is, in keeping the great European traditions of quality and craftsmanship, but adding the quantity that's so essential in the growing world of today. But it seems to me that all that depends on something else the solution of your gravest problem of all, the world shortage of raw materials. Europe can never be self-sufficient in materials, that's certain. But she is taking steps to make better use of what she has. Take this huge plant. It's a new kind of plant altogether, and so far there's nothing quite like it anywhere else in Europe. All these towers and pipes have just one purpose, to extract chemicals from petroleum. What's going on inside? The structure of the petroleum molecules is being changed into other substances, new substances. Polystyrene, for instance, from which all kinds of things can be manufactured. Radios, telephones, paint, even nail polish. That's one way we're meeting the shortage of materials, making fuller use of what we buy from abroad. Here's another way, expanding the use of materials that are locally plentiful. Greece needs buildings of all kinds, desperately. Around the Piraeus, cement has been made for some time on a small scale. Now they're extending the plant enormously with the help of American aid, and they're getting results quickly. You'll find the same thing in the northern countries. 
For example, they've set up a new plant in Norway to make carbide from local supplies of lime and hydroelectric power. I mentioned American aid just now, and that's how a good deal of it has been used all over Europe to assist projects that in one way or another will contribute to assuring European industries of their future supplies of raw materials. Well, that makes a lot of sense. But now tell me something. Say, what's this? Ah, I wanted to show you this because it sums up what we've been talking about and sums it up in terms of a product basic to all modern progress, steel. This is believed to be the earliest steel-producing plant ever commercially operated anywhere. It was installed here in Swansea in the 19th century, in the days of what you could call the first industrial revolution. When it was opened, it was one of the wonders of the world. And believe me, it made good steel. In fact, it was one of the plants that gave Europe its reputation for leadership in the production of high-quality goods. Well into the spring of 1951, this rickety, clanking machinery was still working, still producing 2,000 tons of good steel a week. That speaks volumes for the old-time engineers who built it. But in Europe today, at last we are alive to the danger of just falling in love with history. Obviously, a modern plant of the same size could be producing a great deal more steel of the same high quality. The steel that all the factories and shipyards of Europe are shouting for. In the past, we tended to rest too much on our industrial laurels, to fight shy of bold improvements, to say what was good enough for Grandpa is good enough for me. Now we know we have to face the fact all down the line that what was good enough in the days of the first industrial revolution isn't good enough anymore. You mean, we're living in another century now. Maybe the century of the second industrial revolution. Exactly. And it's you Americans who started it. Look, here's an example of the second industrial revolution. This is the new Abbey Steelworks at Margam in Wales, opened in our festival year. Its output already is one and a half million tons of steel ingots a year. Compare that with the output of that old plant. And by the way, there's a postscript to the story of that old plant at Swansea. Even in death, she's giving one last service to the steelmakers. For the salvage scrap from her dismemberment will go as raw material into the furnaces of her mighty successor at Martin. There's nothing completely revolutionary about it. The principle of making steel is much the same as it was 90 years ago. Where you can speak a revolution is in the manipulation of steel and the factors making for high productivity, the methods of organization, the use of machines to do every sort of dog work. And behind it all are the craftsmen with their skilled, creative brains and hands, turning out in infinite variety of shape and size a material vital to nearly every industry in Europe, today and tomorrow.
men, materials, and machines. In the pulse and pattern of their increase, Europe sees the promise of an abundance she has never known. If now she must direct a portion of their growing power to the purpose of defense, it is to this one end. The provision of a good life for all her people that Europe is striving to fulfill. That grand design in which her industries themselves must play the leading part shall go forward, not faltering in fear, but in the certainty of strength. With such a shield, the achievement of the grand design that Europe draws for her posterity is sure.